everyone. Thank you for being here today. Welcome to our first talk for the DFA NYU speaker series for spring 2021. Design for America of NYU or DFA NYU is a student organization open to undergraduate and graduate students from all schools at NYU. We use human-centered design to tackle social issues in our communities. Our speaker series brings in inspiring individuals to share with us their passion in human-centered design and a social innovation. My name is Akshit Modi and I'm a master's student at NYU specializing in management of technology. I'm a part of DFA NYU leadership team and this is my pleasure to introduce Jaskirat Bedi, a design leader and an experienced designer at Microsoft where she is building the next generation conversational AI platform to help, uh, to help build applications for several industries such as healthcare and education. Jaskirath has 10 plus years of experience in integrating design thinking with emerging technologies for driving social innovation. She has created award-winning products, systems, and experiences that have addressed pressing social and environmental challenges. Some of her notable awards are patent holder for AR-based mobile app at Verizon, winner of Open IDEO's Higher Education Challenge, John Jacket Fellow Entrepreneur at Cornell, and many others. When Ann Lor fired, our faculty advisor shared with us her profile as we were discussing people to invite. We all agreed that we would love to have her join us. As you will see, she is an inspiration and a role model to all of us. Thank you, Jaskirat, for joining today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, this is uh, really kind for the introduction and um, I'm so glad that I get this opportunity to be chatting with you all today. Um, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen. I put together a little uh, visual um, synopsis of what I wanted to share. So just now be projecting my screen. All right, what do you guys see? Your screen. Hello? Yeah, you, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, yeah, we can. Do you see it in presentation mode yet or not? No, no, not okay. presentation. Okay, I'm just gonna move things around a little. All right, so great. I, I see a thumbs up, that's great. Um, so today I just want to take this time today and um, talk about really what design thinking is uh, and how it's evolved, especially in the age of um, emerging technologies and social innovation. Um, but before we get into this really big topic, um, I want to take this time for everybody in this um, chat who's joined us to just tell us what design thinking means to you. And uh, the link that I should share in the chat should be on, should be live. And if you haven't already, take some time to just answer what does it really mean to you? because I'm getting the results and I really want to see what is your perception of design thinking. So I'm gonna give you like 30 seconds for all those people who haven't yet entered. Um, and if you can see, this is the kind of um, great answers uh, we're getting already. Oh, I see, I see a big empathy and problem solving. That's amazing. Oh, collaboration, that's nice. Holistic thinking is great. Hey, I like spontaneity, whoever answered, whoever wrote that. Oh, iteration, good one. Oh yeah, storytelling is also important. Oh, that is really nice. Somebody wrote intentional, that is really great. Um, and so reflective to be intentional. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll start moving, but um, if you haven't already, please feel free to contribute because um, I think in this talk today, hopefully I'll, I'll flip your thinking or I'll add to your thinking of design thinking. Um, this is great, great to see, great to see these words though. Okay, so, um, all the words that everybody wrote today in that chat 
are all really connected with design thinking. But in my experience of using design thinking in the wild, in, in the organization, I think of it as slightly differently. I think of design thinking as a stool that you sit on and that's supported by these three uh, legs of the stool. And these three legs are made of uh, culture, of people and of the process. And this stool kind of evolves as the environment around it evolves. So I was um, reflecting on this and um, I thought about this you know, analog weighing machine and I looked at this product. This product was designed, right? But then um, what, what was the person who was, what was the team who was designing it, thinking about the culture, uh, the people and the process? Were they thinking about um, what is the cultural perception about body image? Who are the people who would buy this product? Where do they live? What was important to them, health or aesthetic? Uh, what kind of manufacturing capabilities um, presented? And what does the team makeup look like? So whenever we, we look at a product, it tells a story about really the culture, the people and process. It tells a story, story about that, um, the, the thought process, which is called design thinking. And then I looked at another product I'm gonna share a video. Um, look at that product and see what has changed. This is Lumen, the first device for hacking your metabolism. Do you hear the audio okay? Okay. With just one breath, Lumen tells you what you're currently burning for energy, carbs or body fat. So you can see what's going on with your metabolism in real time and what to do about it. Breathe in the morning to get a personalized nutrition plan for the day. One that's based on your personal goals and adaptable to your eating habits. Breathe before meals, see how the last one affected you, and get recommendations to keep your body on track. Breathe to see if you have enough energy for your workout or if you should fuel up. Lumen doesn't just tell you what to do, it gives you the whys behind it all why your weight might be fluctuating, why you feel low on energy, why your body is storing carbs. Because the truth is, you have a different metabolism than me, than him, than her, which is why Lumen is nutrition designed for you. This. Okay, so I don't know about you guys, but what I saw, I didn't see a product. I saw an ecosystem. I saw a really smart device, a smart device because it is sensing your breath. I saw a mobile application that is giving you information. I saw a complete diet plan that is engineered to work with this product to, to really promote your metabolism. So it's not about health anymore. It's about being actively managing your lifestyle using this product. So what, what has changed? The culture has changed. The people who are using the product has changed. Previous to the earlier image where probably you saw a person, a person standing. Now you see a whole list of different looking people who are using this product. And, and if you think about it, what kind of team is building it? What is their makeup? Are they just designers? Are they engineers? Is there a um, uh, computing team that's associated? Like this is a sophisticated product that, that supports the market of today. So I thought like this was super, um, kind of um, interesting. So with that, um, hello everybody. My name is Jaskira and I work in the intersection of design, technology and innovation. Um, so I wanted to share today, you know, really my meta metamorphosis of who I have become over the time and why I think that design thinking is the tool for change, especially for, for this environment. And since I work in, um, responsible AI, I thought I could also share some of the role that design is playing in this time and then uh, open it up really for your questions, thoughts, discussions. So um, at Microsoft, uh, really, the, these are the uh, products that I've touched on. There's machine teaching, which is teaching machines how to understand humans language. There's conversational AI, which is uh, building um, applications that communicate with humans through voice and text. 
And then there's um, uh, data platforms that allow users to develop custom model data. So it's really leveraging artificial intelligence as a technology and to build different products on it. But before I got here, um, this is where I was 2008 in India when I really started my journey as a product designer. And this is what my, my landscape looked like in terms of culture, people, and process. You know, design as a, design was something seen as a, as a product of luxury. Uh, designers were only used in areas there was where there was money. There were either, uh, you know, there was a boutique design or there was people who could afford um, designers were, were using their services. Manufacturing dominated. And um, there was a trend where, you know, there were industrial designers or graphic designers. There was no term called users or humans. Everybody was a client. And the process was purely waterfall. Uh, R&D took really years. So it was, it was a different landscape. Um, this is like what happened to me from 2008 to 2013, 14. I started from really, you know, being a product designer or moving to exhibition design, like physical products. Went to school, um, did my master's in strategic design management, learned about design strategy, service design, design research. Um, came out um, into the industry, but I didn't have any job. Like nobody was hiring design strategist at that time. So I, I picked up uh, user experience design because that was getting really hot at that time. Um, and I ended up learning the principles of UX design, UI design on the go. Um, and then I did, I, I think I have um, a little bit of idealism in me that took over and I got an opportunity to, to work as a design fellow in, um, in a non-for-profit. And I wanted to challenge where all I could uh, explore design thinking as, as a tool. So I took it up, I left my um, offer for, for a UX design job. And I said, all right, for, for, for this time, I'm gonna spend my energies and try to see what I can do. So I was running a child nutrition pro program called the Ladu Project, um, which was uh, really my foray into social design. So then as I was in this in industry, as I was navigating, I saw firsthand that this landscape was dramatically changing. Design was not just a luxury, it was a commodity. Software was still on the rise, it didn't really dominate. And then design was, people had started to see design as a system, and yet they were not, um, still, still, still in a flux. There was a rise in graphical user interface designers, visual designers, information designers, and the makeup of team began to change. There were uh, IT architects, software designers, developers, the, the word customers started coming. Uh, still marketing, business finance didn't really talk to other organizations so they were divided. Um, re new research terms came up like usability and R&D became a thing and it started happening much faster. There was still, the process was still very waterfall. There wasn't like concepts of agility or iterativeness. So that was 2013 and now kind of, we, time, time lapse happens and we reach in 2021. In this, in this while, I got married, I moved to United States, I applied to school again, this time I was studying information science, which is a shift um, from my core foundation of design. Um, I got the opportunity to join Verizon at a time when they were thinking about uh, open innovation. So I was the, one of the early teams to really come in and design this program called uh, Concept Studio, which was basically, um, to, to mentor new talent principles of uh, human-centered design um, and then uh, expose them to emerging technologies with the intent of developing new businesses and solutions. So that was a great experience for me firsthand to kind of work in this kind of environment, work across different technologies. Um, and then I moved to um, Seattle where I joined a startup that was building financial products for immigrants. So I spent a lot of time there really understanding what does it take to be a part of a team that is building stuff. And then now um, I'm at Microsoft building conversational AI. So this is what my landscape looks like right now. And this is the reality, like technology has permeated in everything. 
Design is no longer a commodity or a luxury, it is a necessity. Um, there is a rise of uh, big data and ecosystems. There's no, no, more, no more software. It's, um, it's, it's much more bigger than that. Less is good. Uh, and then there's an um, important rise of conscious consumers. I think this is a huge trend in the favor of social innovation and social products. There is no work in life, everything as much as, as we all are experiencing it. And then design has now transitioned into a philosophy where design is taking an active role in ethics and responsibility and transparency. Um, the people who, who are part of this team has changed. You can just see it from this list itself, designers and the kinds of designers have exploded. There's interaction designers, game designers, experience designer, voice user interface designers, strategists. These are common terms that you will see you know, people holding different jobs. And similarly, other, other professionals has exploded. There's data scientists, ML engineers, ethics, policy, governance, people specializing in these areas. Really, this is what the, 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 the people who are building products has changed. In terms of process, it has become like agility, iterativeness, prints, experiments have become mainstream. You no longer have to necessarily explain these things. So the adoption of design thinking has really expedited in different teams. Uh, different kinds of research methodologies, methodologies have opened up. You will see Wizard of Oz, co-creation, rapid prototyping. And this is the need of the hour. It's because the kind of products that we are building need such tools to validate uh, them. And these tools for design thinkers it's like, oh yeah, we used to always have this. But the, like the permeation of these tools into actual development process has increased. There's data in every nanosecond. So you can imagine the kind of feedback that we are getting now, which we never used to get back then. And then in general, you know, it's, the competition has become so cutthroat that you either exist or you acquire your competitors. So our mind mindset in which we live today has changed. But there are some learnings that I wanted to point out that I thought um, was when I was kind of reflecting and making this uh, was worth sharing. Um, while design skills may be domain specific, what I realized is that design thinking is a transferable asset. It's because design thinking is not, it's not a skill, it's a tool. And all the industries, when they're looking for people to join in, they look at both. They look at um, special designers. They look at uh, designers to have domain specific skills, but they also expect them to know design thinking. And that is why there's this uh, T shape that gets talked about because your, your output is rooted in the process. Um, this is what I think I talked about a little earlier, but every measure of design solution is proportional to the environment that it lives in. So when I was working as a design fellow in a non-for-profit, my environment was different. My approach was different, but my process was the same. When I worked at Verizon Open Innovation, um, you know, working on emerging technologies, my environment was different, but my, my process was same. So my output was kind of um, different. And then there's, um, I think the maximum kind of learnings that I've had is because um, of failed prototypes and that which generated unique insights, which I hold most valuable. Um, and hopefully I'll get to share with you a little. So um, this is about where probably I'll share some of the examples where I think design thinking is a tool for change in the current times. Um, the number one thing that I had as a learning is that design thinking champions collaboration. And collaboration is the number one tool to um, initiate change. Um, whenever I was proposing design as, oh, I'm a designer, this is my process, everybody else hear my process, nobody really cared about it. Because collectively, people are more focused on the outcome. They're not focused about a particular process. But as designers, 
if we want people to adapt or get introduced to our process and our way of thinking, it starts with collaboration. And why I picked up this, um, this image. So this is me working at the non-for-profit called Deep Kriha in Pune. I had joined in as a design fellow. This micro ecosystem was unique for me because I didn't really dwell from this area. Uh, I didn't really know the society really well. And I had freshly graduated from school. So I was coming with a lot of frameworks and um, thought that yes, I'm armed with design thinking, I'm going to go and solve world hunger. So I, I walked into this room, you know, with my presentation um, uh, that I've kind of highlighted. And um, I started talking to these um, ladies, introducing myself, introducing uh, who I was as a designer and what I wanted to do. And then halfway through the presentation, I started seeing like blank stares. People were just, look, these, these ladies were like looking at me. And I was like, wait, wait, what happened? So one of the um, uh, ladies, Mossies, we call them, they, they said, they said um, you know, you're saying all this, but we don't really understand English. So what you're saying out there, it doesn't make sense to me. And at that time, that was like a moment of awakening. I was like, I, I think I totally disregarded the, the environment that I was in. And I had to, like, for me, my process was not important, but all these people collaborating with them and working with them and empathizing with these stakeholders was most important. So this was a clear lesson in, in one of the things that design thinking so often talks about is that start with empathy and empathy is not just for your users but also with the people that you're working with with the stakeholders and giving them a chance to talk and share ideas so i had to kind of reject my presentation sit on the ground with everybody and start 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 writing so this is this i think um, picture is a great reminder um for that and then it's it's um collaboration is is the most toughest tool, and it's not just for a good activity to do in a non for profit. Um, it's, it's most important for bigger organizations. And this is a, a, a picture of a brainstorming, a remote brainstorming session that I recently did with a cross functional team at Microsoft. Um, this team comprised of developers, um, program managers, product managers, data scientists, and when I told them that, hey, we have to sketch um, you know, ideas and brainstorming, they were like, whoa, people were uh, scared to do that. But I was like, oh, no, no, it's, um, it's more about collaboration. I want to hear your thoughts. So in whichever format you feel comfortable, let's, let's start with that. Um, and then here, the, the, the outcome of this exercise was really to create um, a feature. And when we were able to all um, tell our ideas, there seemed to be more engagement and cross-functional connections that happen in, in an organization, which otherwise sometimes we forget in our daily lives. So I think for me, that learning was super important, that design thinking puts a focus on collaboration. And there's a reason for that. So whenever you guys feel you can, um, inspire people to collaborate in whichever way they're comfortable, always start with that because you are initiating change. Another learning, uh, a significant learning I had was gaining uh, agreement by proposing experimentation. Um, this one was, was especially unique um, in the environment of uh, non-for-profit where I was working at or, or environments that have resource constraints. So when you anyways have less resources, whether it's you know a team of people who are overstaffed with work, change becomes, people become scared to change because that means that um, you have to take extra time, you need to figure out, you need to do cost analysis. But if, if at um, one thing that design thinking told me was like, let's try it out, let's hack it out. Let's just see what is the, uh, least possible thing that we can do and just, you know, experiment. 
And I thought that strategy worked especially well because it lowers the expectation that people have in terms of what they can commit. And that muscle is important to build. So when I was at um, the non for profit, I used to, you know, um, sketch a lot of things, a lot of ideas that people would generate and show it because there's no cost to sketches. Um, some of them, it was easy to get feedback and then it was easy for us to assess, okay, we can then move this to a lo-fi prototype. And this really helped us because we were able to test a lot of different ideas and then finally see where the impact that we were getting was, um, you know, was worth the time and energy that we were putting. This was the same thing that I used when I was working at Remitly, which is a startup, where um, startup as well is a similar is a similar environment. So I work with the um, the product manager of that team to say, okay, we should come up with a lot of ideas, but let's figure out. So we built a prioritization metric to see what is the effort effort of the team that will take to execute these ideas, and what will be the impact on our users. So when we start thinking about ideas and we start thinking about ideas in a team, it's always good to get agreement and alignment. What is important? What is executable? And I, and I wanna just emphasize on this because I've seen a lot of times um, design thinking focuses on ideation, but execution is where there is value. Execution is where your team can see the outcome. So it's super important to, um, again, think about like, what will it take to execute that idea? What will it take to move it in that direction? Um, the third significant learning that I think is especially important in um, newer technologies is, is, is the ability for storytelling and to really show. Um, I'll, I'll share this video. This is a, a, we used to do a lot of video storytelling um, at, at um, Verizon, at the concept studio, because the technology didn't exist. We, we were thinking about technology solutions and we wanted um, to get buy-in from our leadership to say, give us money, invest in this area that we are seeing. So the, the video that you'll see, all the actors are my, my peers or the newer talents that I used to work with, used to sketch. Um, so I'm just gonna play it out and uh, take a look. So um, just to kind of recap, not, none of this existed. Um, it was just a bunch of designers and um, one engineer. And we all wanted to get uh, the leadership to provide us resources to build, build this and test it out. And we also wanted to engage our partners you know, to see if they were interested in this. And we really did, didn't have anything else except the storytelling video demo. And through this, we got enough funding to start leveraging and building an AI uh, technology at the back end that could start integrating. So this was um, this is one example of uh, show and don't tell, which I thought design thinking teaches. 
Another example, which is fairly recent, is um, my team at Microsoft. We are building conversational meeting assistants. And meeting assistants are slightly different than personal assistants. And um, we as a team, we aside, aside using Wizard of Oz as, um, as, as, a, as this first prototype. And we, we, so many times, we don't really know how to give feedback to the team. So we built this prototype where users can interact with, with this meeting assistant. And actually, this is, there is no technology happening. This, this meeting assistant who is responding is actually a human that is responding in the back. So the show and don't tell, we create like a mirage so that people can actually react and we can then correspondingly build technologies to these real, to the, to the real life solutions that's happening. Um, the reason I shared this example is that this is something that design thinking teaches. It is so powerful, but we forget that is it really used in real world? It is actually used in real world, and this really helps us build future future cases and um, future technologies that I thought was worth sharing. Um, increasingly, I'm seeing this. Um, the role of real design in social innovation, it's, it's, it's now everywhere. Where, whether you look at um, you know, Nike designing inclusive shoes, or I saw this project that was at World Design um, uh, Impact, it got an award called Happy Tap, which is a portable plastic sink, or even um, a read along app from Google that leverages speech recognition and text to speech to teach children how, how to learn or um, this organization called Design Impact that is doing a lot of community work in areas of social justice, leadership. All of these um, examples are leveraging design thinking and different design domains to really come up with newer solutions. So, so um, it, the reason I'm sharing this is that as, as designers, if you're interested in this space, there is opportunity, whether you come from a product design background or you come from a fintech background or you're coming from um, a technology background or you're coming from politics or a history or psychology background, there is space for fusion, for, um, um, for collaboration right here and design thinking plays a role all across. So, um, Kent, now I also wanted to share role of real design in AI in specific. Um, AI is a hot topic these days. And then um, it seems like the role of designers, there is a natural um, tendency to think that designers are going to make AI more responsible um, and equitable. Uh, but I think it's everybody who's working in AI or otherwise, we have to make better um, um, artificial intelligence. But uh, I want to break down three areas that I see um, designers or people from different backgrounds coming and contributing. Uh, the first area that I feel is foundational AI, which is really building the, um, uh, the foundation. So it, whether it's language models or neural net networks and the kind of people who um, contribute towards building this are computational designers, researchers, linguists, uh, subject matter experts. And the kind of things that they really do is that they look for biases in data. Uh, they look for whether the way the algorithms are trained makes sense, are relevant to the context. Um, they, they kind of pr present positive and net negative examples and they lay emphasis for why certain examples are positive and uh, negative. And I think this is super important because AI is built on data and, and data is inherently biased. We can see that data usually um, um, takes a favor for people or regions that have had resources to collect data. And that almost always shifts the balance. So there is an inherent need of people of different backgrounds, different nationalities, different thinkings, identities to come and join and contribute in this space. Um, I, I'll probably share out certain links as well, but um, there's a person called John Mira. He's been a design thinker enthusiast for a long time. 
and he's um, he writes design tech reports and written um, explores ex a lot about computational design. So I would highly recommend if you're interested in understanding the space more, you can probably read that. Um, another layer that lives on top of the foundation of AI are platforms for building AI models. And this platform is super important and it's growing because we want a lot of people to come and build um, AI, AI products. Right now, the space is very, very niche. There's a huge dev community, which is usually male, uh, somewhat super educated people who are building products. But there's this team of designers, researchers, AI designers, subject matter experts that are building um, these platforms. So it's more easier for a huge scale of people to use. And this is really important because more number of people we get to use in the platform, the better AI in general is going to be. Um, the kind of things that this team, you know, team of designers, researchers, subject matter experts, what they're doing is that they're teaching machines. They're teaching machines how to see, how to read, how to make sense. Um, and then we are, we, uh, especially I at Microsoft, my team looks at how should this dev platform um, think about tools so that uh, it helps alleviating certain biases that we know or certain uh, corrections that we can do. Um, a good person to read in this case is Josh Lovejoy. He was initially at Google and then at Microsoft. He writes extensively about design, ethics, and research. Um, and again, share the link as well. He really writes about different tools and techniques that are required in this, in this particular space. And then finally, um, there are consumer products that live on top of um, AI. These are your chatbots or recommendation systems that is used in Netflix, Google search, um, there's image processing. This is where um, designers like conversation designers, voice user interface designers, AI designers, uh, they, they kind of live in this domain. And um, they focus on really how does um, an everyday person interact with, um, with the product. So they really focus on um, human AI collaboration, on trust, on how should AI sound, what kind of principles should AI follow so that they establish transparency. Um, and this, this role is super critical because humans in general, um, we anthropologize everything. We, we give it like a kind of a human connection. And that is really an important um, um, fact to consider when we are designing, thinking about human AI collaboration. Um, so it's a growing field again. Um, one I would recommend um, to, to listen to Kathy Pearl. She talks a lot about conversational design principles. Um, so um, just wanted to kind of share this because the space is growing. And I see opportunity for collaboration in all these areas. Um, sometimes it feels like, oh, it seems um, this is really technical, or I don't know if I'm the, I can contribute. But AI is a growing field that touches all parts of our being. So um, if, you're, if you're interested in just understanding and learning more, there's opportunity for you to come and explore and see and learn and really contribute. Uh, we are at this space where it's important that we get uh, pe diverse, uh, diverse people really contributing and building together. So that uh, was all that I had today to share with you on my talk. I'm happy to uh, have questions uh, and answer uh, or give, give kind of um, listen to what you guys have to say. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'd like to like, I think actually, didn't, I don't know, some Valeria have been looking at the at the chat, but if there are anyone who just wants to unmute themselves and ask the question, uh, I'm sure that works too. But if no, nobody wants to unmute themselves, we have the questions in the chat. <laughs> I have taken like, I, am, I have been tracking these questions. So if someone wants to unmute, like they can ask, or else, like I can go ahead and uh, recite the question. 
Victoria, you had a question. Maybe instead of having, I'm sure Akshit will read it very well, but you could maybe ask it. And I know Manu, you also had a, a couple of questions. So Victoria, you want to start? Yeah, thank you so much um, for just being here tonight. Um, I actually, I'm, I'm, I sit in a center that works on um, business and human rights, and we work with Microsoft very often on issues surrounding AI and disinformation and misinformation. So it's always great to see sort of how things get made too. So thanks. Um, I just had a quick question sort of a, more generally about your career and stuff. Um, I'm kind of changing over from being in a policy political science background to now being in design. And um, it's just a really competitive field. There's just like a lot of people with really awesome portfolios. It could be a little intimidating. So I was just curious, like what's kept you motivated? Was it like, you know, uh, just because you were so in love with design or like, was there something in particular that like, was it your portfolio? Were you always networking? Like, was it just your willpower? Um, yeah, I would love to know a little bit of insight into that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That was such a, a good question. Um, I think for me, what drew me towards design was really that it was such a, a great opportunity to solve problems. Everybody's solving problems, but as designers, we are so connected to the product, we can contribute so closely. Um, so like it's, it's like it satisfied the, uh, the aspect of being a creator and the aspect of seeing that creation being used uh, by people. So, so that was um, that was my always uh, guiding principle and motivation. I always knew that I wanted to create products and I always was focused on uh, creating products that um, were more functional than probably had more form. So I think that was, um, I was uh, therefore I was always drawn towards uh, industrial design or sustainable, like thinking about if products had more meaning than just a, 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 an aesthetic appeal. Um, and then um, design has been evolving. This is something that I learned every year I had to pick up a new skill uh, because I didn't have um, visual design skills, but I learned from my peers. I learned because I was in an environment with them. Uh, I collaborated with them. Um, I learned uh, prototyping or, or newer skills. These skills are not very, very difficult um, to learn. So if you're interested and motivated in going towards this direction, I would recommend to invest in yourself and keep learning these skills. It's important even today as, as a professional with 10 years plus years, I am always trying to see what else can I learn uh, because the pace at which technology moves, it's, it's just something that we all have to keep in mind. Um, so yeah, so I would kind of recommend that. Uh, I remember Manu, you had a question, so maybe you can ask Chaskira directly. Yeah, uh, I also see Pratik or Pratik, you have your hand up, and I have a couple of questions. So if you would like to go ahead, that would be fine with me. Okay, so I just say. So Manu asked, like, I'm curious about the waterfall to agile shift especially how waterfall as a process influenced the role of designers. And the second question is, what is it like to ask for your company leadership to get behind design thinking? Example with the value of storytelling for the firm's goals. Sorry, what is the last part? So she's asking, uh, what, is the, what is it like to ask for, for your company leadership to get behind design thinking? Example okay. with the value of storytelling, for the firm's goal. You're on mute. Sorry, that had to happen once, right? It's not a, it's not a Zoom call to the time somebody's pointed out, you're on mute. Um, so uh, the, the, the second part of the question that you asked is like, what does it take for the company leadership to get behind design thinking? Um, it's, it, it's a lot about the culture of the organization and also knowing what kind of influence do you as an individual have and what you can impact. So sometimes it's important to know that um, where, your in, where your influence boundary uh, exceeds to. And, and it's a good start to start from there. For example, uh, when, I, when I joined Microsoft, I had, uh, or when I joined Grimitly, the startup, 
my circle of influence was fairly small. It was just my uh, direct peers and PMs. And in conversations, I used to talk about, you know, oh, we can try and solve this problem differently like this and differently like this. Um, through that, I think in general, we started talking about including more experimentations. And when I got a, a time during a hackathon project, I got the opportunity to speak to the leadership and I said, hey, I would like to do a company-wide hackathon just focused on design thinking and really build the creativity muscle. It just, it's just a two, one, one day investment, it wouldn't take long. Um, so, so through kind of understanding, uh, you know, what are those small, uh, uh, how do you say, it? like a little bit of a door that opens up and taking that opportunity. Um, sometimes just getting, getting on that and uh, capitalizing that helped. Similarly at, um, Microsoft, what we do is we as a design team, we often do a lot of scenario work, a lot of end-to-end -end work. That really helps the other organizations, especially our uh, tech teams and our PMs to think about where are we going in terms of the product that we are building. And I feel like this is something that designers in particular can do well, because it's easy for us to visualize and show the vision. This is not something that comes naturally to somebody who's really focused on building a feature because they have to really think about uh, the architecture, everything. So it's, it's a little bit of a mind shift. And I think uh, designers in general are really good at handling ambiguity and really being like forward thinking. It's visualization comes naturally to us. Um, so there's like no harm in, you know, just convincing a group of you and taking that ownership to say, hey, let's imagine what a world in the user looks like and, you know, sh showing it whenever, whenever you get the opportunity and chance. Pratik, you can. Hi, Jaskira. Thank you so much uh, for the talk. I, I, I come from a FinTech background uh, and uh, I'm trying to be a product manager uh, in, in the next role that I go into. So, and I've seen the value of design thinking here. So I'm, I'm just curious, like if I am to go out and hire designers, uh, how should I differentiate between between say two two designers who will be fit to work in say the product and and the fintech space? So would love to know say what your PMs at Remitly had had to say about you and how, how did they distinguish between two set of designers? Two wow, uh, so. I think um, designers in general have a huge role to play in um, growing fintech, um, which I say is, is still a growing market because we still are learning how personal management happens, um, how what is the relationship of money in today's world with people. Um, and if you look at different um, uh, domains, so I was really looking at immigrants and this is a market that is, um, really marginalized. There are not a lot of products that help immigrants make better decisions as to how they should save money. So, so the question that you asked was like, how do you hire designers for this product? Well, it really depends upon what kind of product you're building uh, and what kind of um, vision that you think about. Like, are you building a product that is easy to work with or are you building a product that is for enterprises? Um, but in general, uh, if you're looking to hire designers, I would recommend to uh, ask the design process, like what, how did the designer come to the outcome of their design solution? What were the considerations that they kept in mind? Um, what were the kind of explorations that they did? Why did they leave an idea? Why did they select an idea? Um, and then what kind of validation did they do? Um, this, is, this is a part of the design process um, that everybody looks at when people put together a portfolio. Really, like, what were, how were you thinking about coming to the solution? Hope that helped. Yeah, that did. Uh, thank you so much. Tom, you had a question. So? Oh, me? Sorry. <laughs> I didn't hear you call my name. Um, I was wondering, um, you, like, showed us a lot about, like, how the landscape has changed so much. Where do you think it will change in like the next five years. Wow, um, only if I knew that I would be, I would be a really rich person. <laughs> um, 
I, I think, um, I mean, I, I was just looking at some of the people we had. Um, definitely the landscape is moving towards more emphasis on um, uh, computational design. Uh, just because there's going to be a tremendous amount of data that is coming from products all over. Um, so there's, there's going to be a big focus on visualization, making sense of data. Um, AR, VR is a huge space that is growing. Um, robotics is another space that is coming up. So there's a lot of opportunity and growth and research to do in human-robot interaction. Um, there is also um, a huge role in, um, in design and um, uh, privacy. Um, in, in general, I think another trend that I feel is coming back is in product design, is where people are merging um, software and um, uh, industrial design together. Um, so, so yeah, I, I feel like um, in today's world, it is important to know the environment that, is, we, that we as designers, we live in. Um, we no longer can just think about a design solution in isolation. We have to think about uh, how it is going to um, um, connect with the environment that it lives in. And so as, as um, designers, I feel like having that kind of mindset is going to be helpful uh, five or six years. Yes, system design thinking. Uh, and just said that, that is so important. Nobody's going to be looking for a system designer. Nobody's going to say that in, the, in your, in your um, you know, job description or requirement, but that is the perceived expectation that you should have that because that kind of skill is going to help you in your influence of making meaningful products and uh, improving a decision or your, your objective of um, leading change. Even uh, you had a question, right? Yeah, thank you. And thanks just, uh, just here for coming tonight and the great presentation. I'm uh, gonna maybe take us in like a more uh, specific direction around AI um, and some of the things that you're doing at Microsoft. So um, right now, uh, the developer platforms for building AI models are, are still kind of in, like being built out. Uh, but I know Microsoft is doing a lot in that space, but it, it still requires like a pretty heavy technical knowledge to do AI. Uh, like you have to be a data scientist, statistician, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and those people aren't always the same people who know the business problems really well, and that can lead to conflicts. Mm -hmm. And I know that Microsoft is doing things around making AI more accessible and easier to use. Mm -hmm. Do you ever envision a future where, like, so I come from a healthcare background, uh, where instead of having a data scientist and a doctor getting together to do AI, like just the doctor just can do it using some tools or platforms as a part of their job. Yes, that that is that is the goal that we are going towards because um, it's impossible for AI to grow in the expectation that we do without subject matter experts coming in and teaching. So the example of a healthcare professional is a subject matter experts. So that is a goal that not just Microsoft but all other technologies that all of the companies that are working are trying to target. We want um, doctors to become, you know, come and train machines uh, to understand the context or, or the language. Um, one thing that I just want to share, training or um, building language models is so tough because language is a, is, is a living being. It changes the way, uh, you know, humans kind of move. So the kind of way that you we used to speak in um, 1950 is so different to how millennials speak right now with different slangs. How does machine understand that? It cannot be just, you know, a couple of um, developers always changing and updating it. We need subject matter experts. Um, so therefore, you, the most of um, AI platforms that we are building, um, we are trying to, we are, we are trying to, um, make sure that all our team sees this vision and believes in this vision. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's, I wouldn't say we are there yet, but that is definitely the direction that we are moving. And it takes like, you know, pushing and nudging everybody to see that vision um, to do to go there. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question for Manu. So she's asking, I'm curious about where Jaskirat will envish, uh, Jaskirat is envisioning herself as a next step, stay at Microsoft, social design or start a firm? 
I don't know. I just joined <laughs> Microsoft about a year ago, so I'll probably stick around. Um, there's so much more for me to learn. I think the space is exciting. Um, so yeah, for, for foreseeable next, I don't know, whatever time I'm here. But yeah, I mean, if you're if you're if you want to catch up or uh, if you have some ideas about opening something, I'm always up for that. Um, and then I think um, you you the third. Um, question was around social innovation. I think there is no, um, there's hardly any uh, design that's going to happen without social innovation. We've all become such conscious consumers. I mean, just just look at look at what has happened to us in the last last year. Um, if your design doesn't is not social or it's not conscious, it's nobody's gonna buy it. So it's it's almost like um, that is the USP and we all we all have to be responsible about how we think about design solutions. So for me, design and social innovation is not separate. It's kind of um, connected. It's one, one of the same things. I think we are like about time. So thank you so much, Jaskirat, for the amazing presentation and thank you for your time today. Yay, thank you so much. Um, this was really great. And I see a couple of familiar faces. So I appreciate for those guys taking time and joining and hearing through. Mm -hmm.